Hafri and welcome to our first episode of War. During this time of the year, Guamanians here and all over the world reflect on what happened during World War II. While most people have heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, there are so many others who have no idea about the Japanese occupation of Guam. But for those of us that live here, we always remember. In our first episode, we explore and take a look at Guam's wartime experience and also the role music played during and after the war. My Sunshine was one of a few songs that Chamorros sang during the Japanese occupation of Guam during World War II. It was originally recorded in 1939, two years before the Japanese invaded Guam in December 1941. We all know the Tungan, that songs, music, is the universal language no matter where you go. You can go to a foreign country and the minute you hear the music, if you don't understand that language, it connects you to the place. So the Chamorro language is no different in that sense. Local oral historian Tony Ramirez and Chamorro teacher Andrew Gumatautau led a special family day presentation at the Guam Museum called Kantan Guerra, or Songs of War. We are focusing on World War II songs. And the three songs, Agui Flores, that's from the English, You Are My Sunshine. Eotru e Uncle Sam, that was sung uh, during the war in hiding. Then Yotru e Raymond San, a very comical uh, forced labor song. But it connects you to that certain part of history of Guam, which really is only 73 years ago. It's not too far back in history. I During the Japanese occupation and recapture of Guam by U.S. forces in 1944, it's estimated close to 2,000 Chamorros died during that time. One of the most popular songs that emerged during that era was Uncle Sam. Less popular, but just as significant, was a song called Raymond San. Ramon's name is changed to the English version Raymond, and his last name is shortened to San, which means sir in Japanese. Don't 
Insult the Japanese in front of their faces, even on tomorrow. You know, like, um, and one of the ways that that we're going to learn about that is through uh, this work song, because the Japanese relied heavily on tomorrow labor. Whether you were, whether you were uh, a man or a woman, you were put to work if you were healthy. And this work song, folks fun had some tomorrows, you know, who were designated by the Japanese to. To be a sort of supervisor, a leader over, over, over this labor group, and in doing that, this this chamorro was kind of like, in a sense, isolated and, and ostracized, you know, and, and the butt of, of everyone else's jokes. Because after that, oh, he's, I guess he's kind of Japanese now, you know. I guess he's, you know, like he he's turned his he's turned his back or her back on, on on, on his or people, and this song. Kind of pokes fun, but lightheartedly, because you know the Chamorros, they, they knew that you know, they, they, they had to do it. But still, uh, a fun expression, you know, of, of these, what may seem a very hard, and it was a very hard experience. And through the, these songs, you know, they, um, they tried to uh, not think about it and have a little fun while their supervisor was still getting. Uh, Getting water or something. Water out. <laughs> song, it's clear that music played a huge role in life during and after the war. Recently, the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation 
launched the final book in its trilogy, documenting Guam's wartime experience. Victoria Leon Guerrero has been there since the beginning of the project, serving as copy editor. So this is the third book in a trilogy of war stories, war survivor stories that have been published by the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation. And this book in particular takes an uh, interesting look at the role of music in the war. And so it features the stories of 24 different survivors. Um, and it also features articles by local scholars and by descendants of survivors that really take a look at um, not just the role of music in the war, but also sort of coming out of the war. Included in the final book are stories from survivors like Rosita Guzman Duenas Diaz. She was five years old when the Japanese began their attack. From what I recall, it's very torturing that, you know, it's so sad to think about when you look back what they did to my dad. Um, it was actually tortured by Japanese. He's my mother, my dad is a man of all trade. He's, and that time he's a shoemaker, so one of the Japanese got a bag and gave him to make sandals for him. And it, somebody came to claim, you know, and asked him who brought it. He couldn't identify, but um, they tied him on a coconut tree. My mom, my sister, and the little kids were all looking. They were going to shoot him. And uh, I guess somebody told them who, found, who brought the bag to make that. and so. They untie him, and he was a very lucky. But see, when the war started and we had to walk to Maniangun, there's uh, my mom was uh, the youngest one, was two years old. So we had to carry her. We had all our bags. We walked up to Maniangun. Took us only three, four days. And when we came to the camp, we had to build our own camp. And. Uh, we were scared because every time you hear somebody, they, we had to run and hide. And with the family walking, and it just so, 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 so. And, uh, But you know, we, we, when we were there at night, we have to turn off the whatever stove or from the, uh, we cook or heat our food at daytime. So when night comes, we have to no smoke so that the uh, stragglers won't come around. Like Rosita, Jose Santos Torres was just a child during the war. He was eight then. He's now 83 years old. A lot of things happened to us during the war. One of the things that uh, really affects uh, me is that uh, I was privated with my childhood growing up. You know, I missed it. Uh, I missed quite a bit of it. And uh, the worry is the, the torturing of some of our uh, relatives, some are being, uh, you know, killed. Those are the worries, and uh, of course, we hear about the massacre and uh, the ladies that are being uh, abused. And I have some of those, uh, I have cousins in that uh, category, and I have aunties that were uh, in that uh, Massacre. It's hard to imagine a child, or anyone for that matter, to endure and witness the killing of loved ones. During my school uh, time, I, uh, the school in the J Japanese uh, time, uh, we experienced a lot. Uh, my brother was killed by the Japanese. Uh, he was, they tell me that he was whistling the national anthem at the time, but uh, I didn't know, I didn't see it, I didn't hear, but I heard that uh, that was uh, that's what happened. So the teacher actually, uh, you know, the sensei, they call him, took the stick and uh, hit him over the head, uh, I heard many times. And uh, the next day he died from uh, brain hemorrhage. Actually, we work hard uh, to try to get, uh, you know, the family together during the war. My uncles, I saw my uncle uh, got his uh, head chopped off. They made him dig his grave, make him uh, tie his hand behind him, make him kneel, and he chopped his head off. And I saw my, uh, my friend, my father, they put him on a uh, pool cart with a caramel, and they tie him on the back, tied his hand, and they put uh, dynamite on his uh, hand.
and blow it up on, in front of the school. Those are the, uh, the atrocity that the Japanese uh, brought to us wasn't uh, anything that the Chamorro, uh, you know, like to, to hear. Uh, repeating this, that I really, uh, it, it heals me. But books like those published by the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation forever etches in our memories what happened here because they are stories that must be passed on so that future generations never forget. It's a project Victoria says she's humbled to be a part of. It's so exciting, I mean, to imagine that we um, not only have one, but three of these beautiful books that really um, keep these stories alive for generations to uh, read and learn from, and also just to uh, honor these survivors and their life stories and their families. A little known fact, three years after the recapture of Guam on June 28, 1947, it was then President Harry S. Truman that transmitted to the U.S. House of Representatives a request for consideration that was submitted by the U.S. Department of Navy to pay war claims to Chamorros. It was this particular day that was the impetus behind legislation that was introduced by the 33rd Guam Legislature that became law that declared June 28th of every year War Survivors Remembrance Day. It was yet another symbol of how we always remember. Since its enactment into law, June 28th has been proclaimed War Survivors Day. Joey Franquez is a descendant of a war survivor. He led the proclamation ceremony at Adeloupe to honor Guam's greatest generation for their legacy of survival, love, and courage. We must ensure that the sacrifices they made in the name of freedom and peace were not made in vain. In four years of occupation, the Chamorro people were enslaved by the enemy <coughs> forces and endured one of the most tragic and horrific enemy occupations of the 20th, 20th century. A great number of families suffered the loss of life, personal property, and livelihood. An untold number of our women were raped, kids were deprived of their childhood, and thousands were subjected to physical abuse, detention, and torture. There are no words that can appropriately express our love and gratitude to our men Amkuk. Guam's greatest generation who survived atrocities that we cannot begin to imagine today. There are no memorial or gift that properly pay tribute for their courage and love for gathering up the remnants of their lives and moving forward in order to rebuild their homes for their children. <clears throat> they endured and survived, giving life to a new Guam that to this day understands the cost of war. Those who have died fighting for their lives and lives of their loved ones during World War II, those who lost their childhood in the face of horrors and no child should ever face, created and left for us a legacy we can be more than proud of. It is a legacy of honor, courage, and strength forged in fires of war. It's a legacy that we can best honor by forging a united commitment to honor them thereby keeping our island strong and free. The legacy and heritage of our war survivors, our greatest generation, should always be remembered by the Chamorros, the Guamanians, and all Americans. And we continue to fight for recognition in their suffering in the U.S. Congress, hoping they will find an appropriate funding source for the war reparations and not allow the continued tragedy requiring the people of Guam to pay themselves. Although the late President Harry Truman in 1947 made the request for war claims, more than 70 years later, survivors and immediate family members of those who died from the war can finally file for reparations claims directly with the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission. The payouts range from $25,000 to $15,000 for claims of death, rape, and severe physical injury. Claim forms are available in English and Chamorro, and the deadline to file is June 2018. Congresswoman Madeline Berdalio says her Guam and D.C. offices can help those with questions, but some have criticized the law's funding source. It's not new money, 
but Section 30 funds, taxes paid by federal employees here that Guam already receives each year. The war was, what, 70 over oh, close to 80 years ago, and uh, a lot of people were gone, you know. I mean, gee, I mean, there's only a handful of us now left. And, and, uh, and even the way they, they were talking how the compensation is going to be distributed, you know. So, uh, well, I mean, you know, if, if we get the, the reparation, well, I, I'll be happy about that. You know, who won't be? But uh, I, I, I'm not bearing up my hopes, you know. That's the way I feel about it. Forrest Minjola Harris is a survivor of the Japanese occupation of Guam, and like many from his generation, war claims is a long time coming. It's been, what, close to 80 years. Uh, I just kind of gave up on the war reparation. Uh, so uh, if, if the United States uh, ever decides to compensate the Samora, I think it's, it's a more well-deserved it. But, uh, what else can I say, you know? I mean, it's been, it's been a long time since, since the war. And with each passing year, more and more from our greatest generation are dying. Their lives and what they endured must be passed on. Lieutenant Governor Ray Tenorio. Governor Calvin and I urge those of you who still are fortunate to have members of this generation to talk to them, to encourage them to share their stories so their memories will never be forgotten. Every year, we lose more of those stories. For Harris, he says he's fortunate to have survived the occupation. I grew up in Sumai, and I was like uh, nine years old when the bomb, you know, the Japanese bombed Sumai. And uh, so, of course, we, uh, we, we took off. Uh, we uh, ran to Dali, a place uh, still in the military base now. And then we ended up in, in uh, Mariso. And we remained there for about two years, lived through the war. And then we, uh, next thing I know, my, my mom and my auntie were, were working as, uh, I think they were cooks, you know. Um, and so I, I attended school in Marisa for a while. I mean, the Japanese school and then San Antonio. Uh, I have a picture to prove that, uh, you know, we, uh, was a group of uh, people that I grew up with, and uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I just want to say that I'm, I'm lucky that I, you know, I, I lived through the war, in spite of, uh, you know, most people that didn't make it. It's just kind of sad. and in celebration, music has always been a constant in Forrest Harris's life. He's a well-known musician. His story is not only included in the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation's final book, but also he's the featured artist in the organization's Sentimental Journey concert. Music fills this classroom at George Washington High School. Rehearsals for the already sold out second Sentimental Journey concert, a tribute to Guam's greatest generation. The performers are survivors themselves like Forrest Harris and descendants of survivors like Joey Franquez. His father Frank learned how to play the harmonica when he was a child. He played during and after the war. During the course of the war, um, my dad was able to um, do the, the labor work just like a lot of the Chamorros were and um, he told me that uh, at one point he, he was uh, at the ranch with his family one evening and the uh, Japanese soldiers uh, came up there with a, um, a troop of, of uh, Japanese soldiers to, to pick him up and they picked him up and they picked up my uncle John Bloss and um, they were taken down to Hagatnya over to the plaza de España and that's where the Imperial Army was um, gathered that evening and um, 
nobody knew really what they were being taken for and so when they got there um, they were told that they had to perform they had to play so um, he and my uncle went, went on the stage and they started to perform some of the Japanese songs that they had been listening to over the uh, the radio and um, they were able to perform and and just uh, allow the uh, the Japanese to um, listen to the music and enjoy that evening after they were uh, told to that they were going to be allowed to leave and go back home they uh, they were all saying the rosary at the home at the ranch already because they were feared that they feared that they had uh, been taken to be executed so uh, they were quite happy of course that they weren't and um, my dad continued on playing music for the rest of that time and and all the way through the 40s and 50s and 60s my dad was uh, performing for many of the uh, uh, family functions and also the uh, gatherings for celebrations and also he was a performer also playing for and entertaining for the military installations here in Guam all through in that time and so uh, that was his musical career and um, we picked up the music part of it. Music was and is a big part of Brenda Sana's life. She is a volunteer with the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation and organized this year and last year's concerts. Both their parents were survivors of the Japanese occupation, but had a difficult time sharing that painful part of their past. All her family really knows about their mother's wartime experience is that she had to cut her hair short and dress in men's clothing. She since passed away. As for her father, Brenda says he only recently opened up about his experience during the war in 2010 before passing four years later. One of the things he shares with us and all of our children and our family know this story now is that he and a group of friends were uh, saved by a Japanese officer. Um, during one of the marches he actually told them to go and run and hide. And so I think as a result of that my father felt that at some point we would learn to forgive, um, you know, because war is war and it comes to countries that don't want it or don't need it, but it happens. And he really just felt that at some point we would forgive. Both their parents loved music. Like many families after the war, music became a mechanism for healing. Music had kind of helped them cope through the war and also our people are really talented musicians and so um, sort of in that era right after the war you saw these family bands start and these battle of the band contests that really kind of kept that musical energy alive. Brenda's mother Antonia was an accomplished pianist and her father Joseph a talented singer. Their talents were passed on to their children, six girls in all and one boy. Music was a family affair. In the 60s, my parents encouraged uh, my sisters uh, in their love for music and my oldest sister at the time formed the first all-girls band on Guam and they were called Terry and the Venus Four. And so in 1964, they entered the island-wide youth um, band competition and they won first place in their division. And so they played drums, uh, bass guitar, rhythm guitar, did all the vocals, five-girl band, and they just did an excellent job. Mm -hmm. So um, from there, as, as I got older, then I got to sing with them. And then just throughout the years, we've maintained our, you know, our participation in the music community. The Venus Four would become the Paris Sisters. Whether it is encapsulating in literature or words that come to life through music, during this time of the year, we are reminded that we must always remember. But their stories need to be heard and told and, and documented so that we can keep them in our historical archives and be able to retell their stories. And there are just still so many of them that are still in that, in that state of mind where they are not able to tell that story yet because they're still very, very um, affected by it emotionally. And so we want to just make sure that we want to try to ask the, the, the families, their, their family members who are um, struggling to try to, you know, uh, just to keep their stories alive, to have that story documented. And I think that the War Survivors Memorial Foundation is very much committed to doing that. And that's the, the whole mission of their work is try to capture their stories and keep it and document them and so that uh, their, their stories will never be forgotten. Mm -hmm.